Are you trying to raise capital in today's challenging financial markets? Maybe you're struggling to get investors to commit to their investments. Hey guys, I'm Matt Shields and I'm the founder here at Invest in Square Feet. We're a firm that's dedicated to helping business owners and high net worth individuals achieve financial freedom through passive investment in real estate. Today, we're going to be diving into the remarkable story of Ben Schuster, who was able to raise $30 million in 2023, which you might be able to argue was one of the worst financial years in the last century. Some of the techniques that Ben uses to be able to realize this type of success was honestly quite unexpected. But Ben really opened up the kimono on this one and shared some of his personal techniques that he uses both in personal life and also to be able to realize these types of successes in his professional life as well. Wanted to apologize about the audio issues on this episode. There was a bit of an echo in Ben's location. This was such valuable information, though, we didn't want to not publish it. So we cleaned it up as best as we could. Again, apologize about some of the interruptions that might be in this episode. It had an amazing culture. I did feel a little bit of an outsider. I talked about my past, like humble upbringings, like experience homelessness, lived with another family from when I was 12 all the way through 17 years old, put myself through uh, undergrad, went to a non-target school. And so basically I didn't go to an Ivy League school, I just went to a state school and worked my ass off. And similar to your story, which I to get into BlackRock. And so once I got there, the culture is fantastic. A lot of my best friends, mentors, colleagues, so work at BlackRock at left. I was just in Jackson Hole last week visiting oh. with some of our current investors, but also Love Jackson BlackRock. Hole. Yeah, it was beautiful. We had it uh, the first time there and at an investor dinner and there's some ex BlackRock people there. It's a current BlackRock people and a handful of other investors. And it's a fantastic organization. They're not buying up all the single family homes. I was on the real estate investment team. We always joke that it'd be cooler if we work. It's, we just learn. I think that Wall Street Journal article that came out, the they misspoke and put black, black rock instead of black stone. And so then the world caught fire after that. And so it's a great organization, good people. And it really gave me the Apologize about the noise on this particular episode. We tried to clean this up as best as we possibly could, but there was an echo in Ben's location. So again, we tried to clean this up as best as, best as we could. This is a fantastic episode, a lot of great information, so we didn't want to not publish it. Foundation and confidence and skill set to do what I do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and talk a little bit about, so I want to comment first, because this is all about confidence and it's great. I love your story. How again, humble upbringings, you had the confidence, obviously you had the confidence in school because you won scholarships. You obviously were very accomplished in school. And then you had the ability to be able to uh, compete with, we'll say these Ivy league people that probably Black BlackRock was uh, recruiting. You were able to mm -hmm. you know, step up and have that type of mentality there. Talk a little bit about how you develop that confidence, because I think that's a major component when you're raising capital, like being able to come and confidently pitch and position all of that. Talk a little bit about the role that confidence has played and how you develop such confidence along the way, if that makes sense. And it makes perfect sense. These are great questions that, um, it takes time. Like I didn't, I wasn't always super confident, right? So it's like a constant learning process and you, you become more confident through, you know, your, your wins, but more importantly, like your losses, like the mistakes that I made, you know, when I was at BlackRock or along the way, you learn from them, they're painful, but like when you get out of that, so long as you don't make the same mistake twice, is you start to build up confidence. And sometimes you need to fail in order to really build up the confidence. Cause then you, if you're always say you're not taking a risk and you're always within the lines and you, you never have those experiences, then you're gonna have a false sense of confidence. And people can, smart people in the industry, they can smell that out real quick. And I think being humble and not, uh, not coming across like you think you know everything, even with the smartest people in the room, they love that. And it's the people that get eaten alive with the people that do come across with a bit of arrogance. People that know what they're talking about, know what they're doing, they love to rip those people apart. Yeah, I just try to stay in my lane. And I, 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 I 
I'm very confident in what I know and what I can do, but I'm also very confident in what I don't know. It's a learning process. It really takes time. Good mentors, being honest with yourself and just having a lot of experience builds, confidence builds upon itself. And I still, I'm like, I'll be a lot more confident in 10 years than I am today. And so you just got to recognize that. Yeah. And it, obviously you have to have confidence in order to be able to fail too, because a lot of people see that big goal or that big thing, they don't have the confidence to be able to even try it. So they're never going to fail. So there's an element of confidence, even in just getting started and doing something. Right. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think it's like Aristotle that says this, do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. Yeah. You gotta have confidence to take a risk. And, and for me, I just, it was instilled in me. I just didn't have a plan B. And so I've always just, it was, I, I had to get out and, and put myself out there if I wanted to achieve a better life or for myself and my family, but I think risk is really tough for people to take because they don't want to fail, but the more comfortable you can get with failing, the better that you'll become just in the long shot. The best lessons I've ever learned by far is from my failures, not from my wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Uh, we've all had, you know, many failures. Anybody who says that they never fail is obviously lying to you or they're not trying. I think that's another famous quote. So you, are you able to, to say how much you raised for BlackRock when you were there? Is that yeah. So it's a collective group. I worked under a couple of senior managers, but it was north of between three to $5 billion. These are larger ticket sizes. So you're working with large pension funds, endowments, multinational, like multifamily office, and like even sometimes with sovereign, like sovereigns. And it's a longer sales process. So you're working with their consultants it's months, if not years that you're working on a specific deal to then close versus in my role now, it's very quick. It's high paced. The tickets are obviously a lot smaller. So last year we raised $50 million, 30 million of which was fresh in capital. 20 million was that 1031 rollover capital. We sold deals and then rolled that over into the up leg of the next deal. In a time where it was very difficult for a lot of real estate investors to raise capital. So I'm, re I'm really proud about that coming in and, yeah. and helping the team raise that was the biggest record. It was the biggest year we had on record by far. So very proud about that. But yeah, at BlackRock, it was much larger, but it's a different, it's a different sales cycle is what I would say. And the clientele is a lot different. I work directly with business owners, doctors, other professionals, and it's their money, it's their capital, it's their retirement. And so it's a lot more emotional, but I like that. Like emotional in all the best ways. And I, you could really like, when I like feeling like I'm adding value and helping, I don't want to say normal people, but just day to day people that you yeah. run into versus more like institutions, which obviously they are backed by their clients, which are firefighters or teachers or whomever, these tensions, but the, the people that you're interacting with are analysts and kind of these are folks that cycle in, cycle out. They're, they're, it's not directly their capital. So it's just a different type of conversation. And so I really like the relationship building that I have working with high net worth individuals. And it's just so interesting as well. It's, these people have such diverse backgrounds and so you can just learn really ways that people have made it in life. And a lot of our investors didn't attend college and are, have built businesses and are extremely smart entrepreneurs. And those types of conversations are so much more fun and you just build lifelong relationships and friends with versus like in, in the institutional realm, it could feel a more transactional. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And I completely agree. Love being around entrepreneurs and that's, those are my people, right? Love, love being around people that are changing the world in their own way, right? You worked with BlackRock. You obviously had an impact on this smaller firm, bringing probably some of those things that you learned from BlackRock over into a smaller company. Again, you raised about $30 million. It sounds like there was $30 million-ish worth of fresh money. Maybe that mm -hmm. all came from you. Maybe that didn't come from you. But what are some of those high-value things that you took from your experience with BlackRock and were able to correlate that, translate that, bring that over into the next, the next company. What were some of those high value things that you added that you feel really made a big impact in that money raising capability? Yeah, I think bringing a professional institutional capital raising capacity to the more smaller mid-size like market paid huge dividends. And like by that, it's just like revamping like marketing presentations, right? So like having a professional looking presentation, the way that it flows, what's the type of information that you're conveying and then educating investors as well as 
it's not just the returns, right? It's like being able to compartmentalize those returns based upon risk. So like at BlackRock, like I would never go out with a specific fund without categorizing it as like maybe core plus value add or like opportunistic or development. So you need to be able to communicate not only here are the returns, the projected returns that we're projecting, but here's the amount of risk that we're taking. So I spent a lot of time early on when I came onto the team educating the entire investor base, like what core means, what core plus means, what value add means, and then like walking through here are the returns currently in today's market, generally speaking, for what we're investing. Here's what it means to buy a core deal or a core plus deal. This is where occupancy generally falls. This is a general business plan. So that was huge for me to convey because we're a value add shop that they've pivoted into more core, core plus deals as things got a little bit more, how would you say, crazy towards the end of 2023, just with the spiking and so forth. Yeah, yeah a little hairy. I like that one. It was important for me to not have a conversation with somebody and they say, hey, like the last deal had a 20% AAR average annual return. This one has a 15. But I was like, yeah, the last one has is, is 80% occupied. This one's 100 or 95% occupied and the rents are only 20% of the market where those are 40% or what have you. But that's a really... Uh, important point. I don't think a lot of people do that well, conveying risk and reward. They just talk about reward. And so that's another piece, just like email communication, right? Like bringing just a professional kind of aspect to just how we convey ourselves to the marketplace, at least to our investors. And then as well, I'm on the phone a lot speaking with investors. And so I'm happy to take a conversation any which way. And, and I have a background in other asset classes besides manufactured housing community. So I've done single family developments, I've done retail, I've done industrial, and I've done class A multifamily. So I'm happy to talk about compare and contrast different asset classes. I'm happy I started my desk, I started my career on a trading desk, finance and economics background. And so I'm happy to talk through what's going on in the market. Obviously not giving investment advice, but I think people get, they feel confident. And if I'm conveying that I like the deal or if we're buying this deal and I could talk through them across the entire, what's going on in the entire economy, at least in my opinion, and and compare that and contrast that to different different investment vehicles, whether it be last year, the big topic was like CDs or like money market funds, just given that you can get a 5% risk free rate. And so being able to talk through the risk and rewards of that, obviously doesn't have a lot of risk, but you lose the opportunity cost of not investing, right? you get the appreciation as well as with the CD and also, which a lot of people don't understand that 5% you pay taxes on it. So that's a gross. And then, you know, you obviously got to consider the, the tax bill that you'll get. Whereas in real estate, which hopefully all your listeners know, the distribution that you get from an IRS perspective is a, it's a return of your capital. So you don't pay taxes on that dividend until you receive 100% of your invested capital. So you're deferring gains, of course, but I love to defer gains and, and just grow my passive cash flow and then utilizing strategies like the 1031 exchange and or depreciation and offset those gains when you do monetize and just continue to focus on building that passive cash flow, ca that passive cash flow. Because at the end of the day, it's all about cash flow. Like everyone works for a paycheck, that's cash flow. Generally, if you're a W2, you, you're only bringing home about 60% of what you make on paper. I experienced that firsthand at BlackRock. I did love that. But once, I, once I had that paradigm shift of saying, okay, I'm not going to continue to climb the corporate ladder and just make as much money on paper. Instead, I'm going to take a step back and have the, the delayed gratification, but just continue to invest in cash flowing real estate with the purpose of in five, 10 years, I'm going to have significantly more cash flow than I otherwise would if I just continue to put all my eggs in the basket at a W-2 and no one can take that away from me, right? It's, I think that's true financial freedom. So in my opinion, financial freedom is where you can do the things you want and you can afford to do them without having to clock in and clock out. So I just love real estate and that's why I'm so passionate about it. It's just because of the tax advantages. It's because of the cash flow nature of it. It's because it's the appreciation, the hedge to inflation, and it's and it, everyone needs it. So it's a real estate. We're in residential. We're in affordable housing. Everyone needs a roof over their head. It's so important, and so we don't have enough roofs in America. So it's going to be a continued driver, regardless of market cycles. As long as you're conservative and you don't get too over your skis of it, things happen the last couple of years. With some folks, those cycles are always going to happen. But if you play this for the long game, then it really, you'd be shocked at where you will end up in 10, 15 years because of just the fact that things just continue to get more expensive, rents continue to climb. 
And we have a massive shortage of homes in the United States. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Yeah, no, completely agree. And obviously we have construction delays and construction projects that are being put on hold right now. So in a few years, it's going to be even worse, right? Where the inventory coming online is even going to be diminished. But taking this back, I'm curious the steps that you might be able to suggest to someone who might not have a Ben in their organization where they're doing these different things. You mentioned a lot of things about the knowing the local markets and learning about these various different asset classes. Do you have a, do you have a a hierarchy or I guess maybe a way to be able to maybe start to shift some of the focus? Because I'll say that a lot of people that I've seen pitch and probably even us uh, as well, will focus in on whatever that return is. And like you said, not necessarily focus on the risk side of things. So being able to incorporate that into the messaging, where would you go and find that type of information to be able to even incorporate it into your presentations? I think if I understand the question fully, I focus a lot on just markets specifically. So I'll zoom out, right? It's like a funnel, talk about the market, what's happening, right? Like the biggest drivers for real estate population and job growth. And so I'm always like servicing the market. We're investing in Phoenix primarily as our market. So there's a lot of development that's happening. There's a lot of job growth because of this industrial corridor that was built in 2017. It's the 303 loop. And so there's 100 million plus square feet of class A industrial space in that set market. And then now you're starting to see huge manufacturers come online. So how many semiconductors is investing $40 billion in building out semiconductor chip facilities in the West Phoenix Valley. It's the largest foreign investment in U.S. soil. And there's a lot of ancillary kind of projects that are happening due to that kind of seismic you know, shift and a huge company planning to flag there. And so you have like Amcor, who's going to be doing a lot of the packaging and the distribution for those chips. And then you have Intel that invested a couple of billion dollars to set up their, their semiconductor facility. And then it's going to, that type of industry is going to have all these additional kind of service job movements to support that. And not only do you have that huge industrial distribution corridor that has tons of like workforce that it needs, that it needs to support those types of businesses. But then now you're having like really huge industries there, like very strict to just U.S. kind of security and growth and development and across the world. So I like places where there's population and deployment growth or in affordable housing. So those are key. And then I'll break it down once I'm in, after the market, then I'm going to go into the specific property, the sub market, what's around it, what, how far is the retail in that space? Is it walkable? What is the type of retail? What about the schools? Do a rent to rent versus own comparison for a single family home in that area. I'll look at comparable or class C to class B multifamily projects that are in that vicinity. What are they renting at? Do the rents that we currently have in place is to justify the affordability of that specific submarket. We have the benefit of owning a lot of other properties within the markets that we invest in. We don't do a scattershot approach. We buy in very specific locations where we build portfolios and then combine those portfolios and package them to sell them to the institutional buyers. And we get cap rate compression from that and our investors benefit from that, from seeing larger pops or appreciation when we do go sell. And so I'll just talk through those. I think anytime you're buying something, you need to think about what are your downside risks? So we run downside scenarios and I send the models directly to our investors, right? To play with them, right? Because I could tell you, I can give you any IRR you want. It's all based upon this assumptions, right? So what are those assumptions? So being able to play with like rent growth or exit caps or expense runups, those types of things, occupancy. Um, we open up the Komodo for our investors. We're not, we don't broadly market our investments. Every single one of our investors, we have about 250 investors who built the company completely organically 15 years by word of mouth and referrals. So we're very transparent. We've never lost investors capital. We've never had a capital call in our 15 years. So we pride ourselves on that and just serving normal people. But I think going to your point, like it's hopefully someone that's listening to this, that's doing something similar, like they're doing that because it's not. I, I, hopefully I'm not saying anything that's like groundbreaking. Let's actually transition over into the high value tasks that you that you have. So one of the one of the goals with the podcast here is to be able to uncover the very high level things that you feel are very high, highly ROI for your daily your daily procedure, right? So these are the goals, these are the things that you find are making the biggest impact in your life, your career, and some people go on the personal side, some people go on the professional side. So 
when I ask what is the highest ROI thing that you feel is making the biggest impact in your life right now, what would your answer be? And then what are the steps that you take to be able to accomplish whatever that high value task is? So the idea here is that if we have another person who wants to achieve whatever this thing is, here's the recipe, here's the goal, and then here's the action steps that I need to take to be able to achieve whatever that goal might be. So when I say that, what comes to mind for you? Yeah, I, my success is, has been built upon building relationships over many years. And so there's not really a simple formula to it. It's really getting around folks that you hope to be like or can add value to you or you hope to be an investor. Say if you don't even have a fund, if you're just working at W2, but your dream is to start a private equity real estate firm, like start like, building those relationships now before you need to sell anything. Because the reason why I was able to be so successful my first year of leaving is because over the last 10 to 15 years, I've cultivated and built these relationships built upon trust. And it takes a long time to do that. And I never did that with the intent to then call them up and say, hey, I've got an investment opportunity I think you should check out. I did it because I thoroughly enjoy it. And I was curious and I wanted to learn from these people. And I just enjoyed their company and their advice. And, and so I think like the best thing that anyone can do is there's not a magic email. There's not, I can go through my steps or what I do when we're preparing to launch a new, a new investment opportunity. But none of that matters unless I had the relationships, the trust, the credibility, the background that has taken me a long time to get. There's not really an easy way to get into the position that I'm in without a lot of hard work and time. And it's fun. Like I have the best job in the world. I, I get to go and have lunch and sit on the phone and do investor event, events with people that I genuinely care about and that are my friends and mentors and colleagues and all of that. And so I have the best job in the world. And I get to talk about my favorite subject, which is real estate investing and markets and specifically manufactured home communities. There's not an easy button. I think that the best thing that I do, which I started doing recently, is I jump in the cold, the cold to ice bath every morning. It's when you're in a rule like mine, state is incredibly important. So what I mean by state, it's the way you feel, to focus, what are you telling yourself in your head? Every conversation I have with somebody, I need to be coming from a state that is what I want to represent, which is it's relationship building, it's educating, it's, it's solving problems, solving their problems. And I think the biggest thing that anyone could do is wake up in the morning, do breath work, jump in a nice bath or do go for a run. Like you need to be clear headed and then focus on people that you're trying to, to serve and solve their problems and be genuinely curious, be genuinely curious into what they do and what matters to them. And don't focus upon what is most important to you. And you'd be shocked if you do things for, for other people, it, it just, it's amazing that what happens over time to your career versus if you go in with the attempt, like, how can this person help me? It's very short-sighted and you're going to have a really hard time raising capital or having somebody vet you or, or stick their neck out for your next job or your next kind of jump into your career. So yeah, hopefully that's helpful, but it's, there's not an easy there's not an easy kind of way to do it. It takes a lot of time and patience and it's fun. It should be fun. It shouldn't be work. Yeah. I, I could take this so many different directions right now, but I like the way that you phrase it, the state side of things, right? Like your mental state of things and how you're presenting yourself. Obviously we all have difficult times. We all have times when we're down or we're not feeling into whatever it is that we're doing. Uh, talk about how, when you get into those types of situations. How do you pop yourself out of it? Let's just say, again, you had a bad day, whatever happened, but you have a big event this evening with someone who yeah. you have this great relationship with. You've known them for 10 years and you should be looking forward to them, but you just don't feel like going to this dinner or event or whatever it is. But you have to do that. Getting yourself into that state where you're able to go and put on that, we'll say the put on the performance, if you will, but make that connection and make that genuine effort to be able to be there and be present with those people. Because again, I think a lot of people have a lot of things going on in their mind, the whirlwind in the back in the background is always distracting them and all of that. So I'm curious how Ben takes those types of situations and is able to focus it into a valuable 
interaction with other people, right? Does that resonate yeah. at all? No, it, it does. And I'll tell you exactly what I do or something. These are great questions, by the way, Matt. So I'll open up the kimono of exactly how that, that happens. It's so true, like who you're pinning down. So for example, before I went to that investor dinner and I was gonna be around really smart, more successful people than I was, and I was gonna give this speech, what was I doing in my hotel room? And I was listening to music. I had uh, written out on you know, a piece of paper, my state, who I wanna be, like my body language. Maybe I'm doing jumping jacks or things that get my blood flowing, right? And you're manifesting it, you're talking out loud. And I know this sounds like super corny, but you're asking, this is what, this is what it, it takes sometimes. And, and that's just for me, that's what I'll do. If I need to go work out, if I'm really on stress and pressure, I'll go release that tension. But yeah, I'm essentially getting myself in the mindset of who I want to be. So I'm a big follower of Tony Robbins. And so there's a thing in Tony Robbins trading. It's called the triad. Anyone that's listening, you can look it up. But you could essentially create your triad and based upon what state you want to be in. So whether it's your money raising state or your big decision making state. And, and you'll go through what is, what's your body language? What's your focus? What's the language? And if you write that out and you exactly who you want to be. And you read that out loud and you do that enough times right before you will, you will be that. Right. Yeah. So I know that's corny, but you asked. And so I, I no, I, this, this is what it's all about. No, this is what I, this is what I love. So the triad approach, is this a, a, how can I say this? You attach these certain events or these certain things that you do to this type of a state or this type of a, a being. So you know that your recipe to be able to be in the presentable state is go and work out, do a cold plunge, this and this, mm -hmm. and then to be over here and be a, a different type of personality, you would change that a little bit. Is that the way that this works? Yes. Yeah, correct. So depending on what state you want to be like, here's my, I'm a father and I have a wife. And so here's my, I'm a great dad state, right? It's like, I'm relaxed. I'm attentive. I'm listening to my wife. We're enjoying this. It's fun. This is like those types of things. You're putting yourself, visualizing putting yourself in those positions. That way you're not bringing home the, oh, I'm stressed from work. I just got off a bad investor call, bring that into your home and then your wife's kind of pissed off and you're not being the father you want to be. These are just tools and tricks that kind of help you get into the state that you want to be for every different scenario. And so you could have many different of these triads or state management, but that's been the biggest eye-opening moment for me. And it came last year where I started to do this. And it was because I was on the phone with so many people, interest rates are going crazy. People don't want to necessarily invest because they get 5% in the CD. And why would I substitute that for an investment that's paying me 5% cash on cash starting out? And so I would get off some of these phone calls and like, oh man, like I really fell my face on that. And then I'd pick up the phone and make the next. And I was like, God, now I'm really screwing up because I'm coming in such a bad, I'm bringing the, that feeling that I had of rejection into the next conversation. So we have a coach and, and we work through this a lot. And so if I have one of those kind of, oh crap moments, I, this isn't the way you want to feel, or this isn't who I, isn't who I want to be, then go walk, you have your triad, but take time to write it out read that triad, maybe do a workout, whatever, reset, and then make that phone call where you're in that, you're in that position that you want to be in, whether it comes across in your voice, the things you say, you know, I was rushing and, oh, here's the deal, blah, 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 blah. And people are like, man, you're overwhelming me right now, right? Whereas I'm jumping out and go, hey, Ken, how you doing? How's the family? Oh yeah, I'll tell them the story about what we did talk for 20 minutes and then, and then oh i did see that email you sent yeah it did sound pretty interesting we have some cds that are only yeah mark me down for 250 you didn't even pitch the deal right because yeah. you came from a state that i wanted to be in whereas i was building relationships i was letting the conversation flow i'm trying to solve problems yeah now you're opening up the kimono i'm let you know as far as having me kind of still exactly how i go through that in my my mindset and something that i constantly work act and evolve and try to grow, but it's huge in what you do. Raising capital is very emotional. Money is very emotional to people. It's like Bates, family, finances, like I kind of know importance in those three or in, in that order. And uh, so it's an emotional game we play. Investing's an emotional game. So you need to be uh, calm, collected and, and in the right state to make, to make the right decision. So yeah. I, I love it. I love it. I, I want to maybe end with with this i'm curious just pick one of the one of the best triads whatever one you're most proud of or you feel has the biggest impact in your life whether that be personally professionally what all is entailed in that triad where like you've written these things down and this is again the recipe to be able to get into your most impactful state would you say 
<laughs> yeah, I was actually doing one yesterday. So maybe I'll kind of just since it's top of mind. And in the middle, it's like, I am achieved, right? It's just like a, a feeling of gratitude. And in the bottom, and like, that's like your body language, like how you feel. So it's like, I'm relaxed. And that goes through, like, I, I'm hydrated. I'm, I feel good because I'm eating well. I'm not hungover kind of thing. I'm not drinking. Uh, and then I go into my focus. Like, I'm focused on executing the, ta the task at hand. I'm focused on living in the moment, being present. Those types of things, like, where I'm just, what is the best day for me? It's like when I'm not thinking or stressing about what might or what might not happen, but I'm just living in the moment. And then my language is, I'm gonna, so try it as a triangle, right? In the far secure like language and it's and i talk through like who, how i'm having a conversation with somebody and what are the things that i'm focusing on and what am i focusing on what's the type of language that i'm saying to myself and so like that to me is like coming from a place where you're coming from a place of gratitude where you're not looking at trying to look at all the things that can go wrong or be in stress you're at peace and then and then when you're in that moment it's magical what can happen the types of conversations you have and yeah, so that's like my gratitude um, type triad that kind of encompasses my just every day. I have a money raising state. So when I'm raising money, I want to be in a family hat state, right? I will go through all those. Hopefully it gives you a feel of like what that is. It's going to be different for everyone. So everyone's going to be focusing on whatever's the most important to them, what they're trying to get better at. And yeah, go to me, go to tellyrobbins.com or look it up the triad and no step by step, much better than I ever could do on a podcast, talk to you about how to complete your triad and focus on your state management. Uh, and I think that will hopefully do a handful of listeners. If you actually implement it, it will change your life. And if you wanted to learn more from Ben, go ahead and check out their website, which is comfortcapital.com. And if you wanted to email Ben directly, he gave us his direct email. And that is ben at comfortcapital.com.